Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I bring you episode 87, and this is going to be a particularly good one, as it's the first in a four-part miniseries on the arthropods, which will take up the rest of this regular series on the protostomes. After this episode on the arachnids, we'll explore myriapods, and then the crustaceans, and finally, the hexapods, which includes the glorious biodiversity of the insects. This will wrap up our series on the protostome side of the animal kingdom, which will take us all the way to the next series on the deuterostome side of the animal kingdom. So with that being said, today's episode is all about the arachnids, or more generally, the chelicerates. But before we can get into the meat and potatoes of the episode, I have to set the evolutionary context. To get things going, I want to talk for just a few minutes about the evolutionary origins of the arthropods, so that the content in this episode, and the next three episodes, makes a bit more sense. So around 400 to 500 million years ago, the Spiralia lineage diverged from the main protostome line, producing the annelids, the mollusks, and more. Left behind in the protostome lineage were various worm-like creatures, which I explored at length in the first episode of this series, episode 85, A World of Worms. In that episode, I described the nematodes, the priapulids, the kynorhynchia, the onychophorans, and more. This unfurling branch of the protostome family tree was producing a broad diversity of mud-eating creatures, animals that sifted or filtered or plucked food particles out of the dirty substrate at the bottom of the sea, or a lake, a river, a marsh, or a swamp. Perhaps the most famous of them, one that I'm sure you've heard of, are the tardigrades, or the water bears, which are microscopic six-legged animals that can survive many extreme environmental conditions. Some of the emergent features that were beginning to be developed in this early basal arthropod lineage included things like hardened exoskeletons, the ability to molt to shed the exoskeleton and grow a bit larger, the presence of segmented body forms, and jointed limbs. The hardened exoskeleton provided some physical mechanical protection, as well as a a hard platform for muscles to attach to to allow the the limbs to move, for the, the body to move. The ability to molt goes hand in hand with having an exoskeleton. Molting is a way for the animal to grow larger, despite having this hardened shell or exoskeletal structure that will constrain their size. As this hard body part can't really grow, and it's not very flexible so it doesn't bend that easily, the animal's soft body will grow inside of it until it's time to molt. The old exoskeletal structure is worn down, stretched, ripped, stripped off and removed, revealing a fresher, paler, softer exoskeletal structure underneath. For a short period of time, this new, softer exoskeleton allows the animal's softer internal tissues to plump up with water, to grow and expand, until the the new exoskeleton hardens into place. In order to grow larger, another molting sequence is necessary. On that note, segmented body plans allow for more complex morphology, with only minor adjustments to a set of genes that get used to build each segment. We'll talk about this a bit more in the episode on myriapods, where the the segmentation effect is much more obvious. The arthropods' evolution of jointed limbs provided several really important benefits, including strength and stiffness that you don't get with tentacles, and it also provided a series of joints that provided a practical level of articulation. Jointed legs allow for a smooth and energy-efficient means of locomotion in a terrestrial environment, where animals are finding themselves mostly out of the water and having to hold up their mass against the force of gravity. Now, all of these groups that I've mentioned so far, they've all been nested ancestral groups to the Euarthropoda, which are the true arthropods. So these, everything I've mentioned so far has been going on in the ancestors to the arthropods. The first true arthropods to emerge were the early predatory chelicerates, which are the subject of today's episode. 
After these early chelicerates came the myriapods, which include the centipedes, the millipedes, and all those long, mini-legged, creepy crawlies. After them came the crustaceans, which include a sprawling and diverse family of crabs and shrimp and lobsters and everything else. And from within this, from within the crustaceans, came the hexapods, which produced the staggering biodiversity of the insects. Now these all came later, and they'll be the subjects of the following episodes. Okay, so now with this evolutionary context described a little bit, I think we're ready to look at the Chelicerata themselves. This major division of the arthropods includes some 77 to 78,000 known species, and there's estimates that there may be up to half a million species that remain undiscovered and undescribed. The Chelicerates are a remarkably diverse group, but there are several traits that bind them all to a shared evolutionary legacy. All Chelicerates have bodies with two major segments. The prosoma in front, which includes a fused head and thorax structure, and the opisthosoma, which is the abdomen, or the, the posterior structure behind the head and thorax. They all have a thin, armor-like cuticle composed of a protein-rich chitin matrix, and they all have jointed limbs, although the precise number of limbs varies from species to species, as you'll soon learn. They also have structures called chelicera, which are specialized limbs mounted on the head, by the mouth. These chelicera take many forms, and they serve many different uses, but generally speaking, they're involved in sensory perception, defense, handling food, or something else like that that requires proximal handling near the face. These structures are what gives the clade its name of chelicerates. Now, many species of chelicerate also have a second pair of smaller appendages next to or under the chelicera, and these are called pedipalps, and they're used to some degree in feeding and reproductive behavior. Although the ancestors of the chelicerates were predatory, their descendants have adapted to pretty much every feeding strategy. Some of them are herbivores, and some are carnivores, some are detrivores, and some are parasites. Within the chelicerate lineage, venom is a commonly used tool, having evolved independently, depending on how you define that, three, maybe four times. Now, I'm going to get into the family tree, but first, I want to clarify some stuff. Like many protostome groups, the taxonomy of the chelicerates is being reformatted in light of new genetic and molecular data. But in this case, even the genetic data is complicated and the position of certain groups is ambiguous at best. For example, the scorpions have apparently been a really difficult case. They have anatomical features that suggest an early aquatic divergence of a monophyletic scorpion clade, but there's confounding genetic data that suggests, among other possible interpretations, that there's some kind of paraphyletic grouping, wherein the animals that we call scorpions are actually a bunch of distantly related groups that have all evolved a similar convergent morphology. Several other groups besides the scorpions are also ambiguous, so what I'm going to do now is explore the chelicerate family tree in order of most basal to most recently diverged, in the order suggested by the most recent genetic evidence that I could find and reasonably understand. Okay, with this disclaimer in place, let's get started. The Pycnogonum, or the Xyphosura, also known as the horseshoe crabs, are both the most distantly related cousins in the Chelicerate subphylum. The Pycnogonum are an obscure group of deep water sea spiders with block shaped bodies, thick, chunky, jointed limbs with few hairs or spines, and no Chelicera. They're like bulky spiders, trying to be like some hardcore deep-sea crab, except they don't have claws. The Xyphosura, or the horseshoe crabs, are much more recognizable. There's only four living species, and each of them have hardly changed at all across several hundred million years of natural history. These large, slimy, spiky creatures are characterized by a broad carapace that covers their body, and along their underside, they have five pairs of gills, a fused abdominal plate with five pairs of spine-covered legs, another pair of vestigial limbs covered in hair and spines, and a long tail. 
Their chelicera take the form of little, pincer-like arms that can grab food and shuttle it to the mouth, which is positioned on the underside of the head. To demonstrate the phylogenetic isolation of the Pycnogonum genus and the horseshoe crabs in relation to all of the other chelicerates, consider this. The Pycnogonum is the most distantly related chelicerate of them all, and all of its immediate relatives are extinct. There's five known genera that exist between the Pycnogonum and the Xiphosura, but they're all extinct. Among the Xiphosura, there's those four extant species I mentioned, but there's also at least four other genera that are all extinct. And between the Xiphosura and the rest of the surviving arachnids, there's seven more genera, and they're all extinct. So you can see how this is actually a huge and diverse lineage, but huge swaths of the family tree have been trimmed away. Only the Arachnida class persists, enjoying an immense biodiversity and ecological spread. Now, I'm going to get into the Arachnida class in a minute, but I want to say a few words for the fallen, for these many extinct species that we skipped over to get here. These include the Basal Ophicolis, Venestulus, Pseudoniscus, the Comanchia genera from the Silurian period, and the Weinbergina and the Langrandella from the Devonian period which all loosely resemble the horseshoe crabs. There's also the elongated, almost lobster or shrimp-shaped chasmataspidids from the Mid-Devonian, and many more. The vast bulk of these species are some form of sea spider, or a horseshoe crab look-alike, with an aquatic, or, at most, an amphibious habitat. Alright, so now we've come to the really exciting part which is the class Arachnida. As one of the few remaining groups in the Chelicerates, the Arachnida dominate the biodiversity charts with over 100,000 named species, spread across 16 subdivisions. Of these, four subdivisions have gone extinct, but the remaining 12 are represented by some number of still-living species. We'll explore them all, and this should take us to the end of the episode. As the phylogenetic relationships within the arachnida are in flux and subject to change given new data, it's a little tricky for me to organize all 16 subdivisions according to their order of evolutionary emergence. For example, earlier genetic data suggested that the horseshoe crabs of Xiphosura were relatively basal, but a genetic study from 2019 found that they could actually be a subdivision within arachnida. So, that's confusing. Instead of trying to figure all of this stuff out, let's just look at the four extinct divisions first, and then we'll get into the living divisions. So, these extinct groups include the Plesiosiro, the Phalangiotarbi, the Trigonotarbida, and the Uraraniidae. Unfortunately, not much is known about any of them in any great detail. The Plesiosiro existed for a brief time in the late Carboniferous, and they loosely resemble modern ticks, or harvestman spiders. This is also true for the Phlagneotarbi, which existed for a much longer period of time, from the early Devonian to the early mid-Permian. The Trigonotarbida existed during the late Silurian to the early Permian, and they were very spider-like in appearance, although some major differences include the Trigonotarbida's lack of web spinnerets, and its possession of a thick layer of armor plating along its back. The Uraraniidae existed generally later than these other groups, from the Mid-Devonian to the Mid-Permian, although there are suggestions that they may have existed much later, possibly deep into the Cretaceous, although that much is largely educated speculation. After the first Uraraniidae were discovered, they were initially thought to be spiders, because they actually did have web spinnerets. But they were ordered as a separate taxa because they have a tail, and spiders don't, and because their spinnerets are placed differently within the animal's body. Alright, so that was a brief glimpse at some of these extinct groups within Arachnida. Uh, but let's transition to looking at the extant groups, with representative species that are alive today. I'm just going to go through these in alphabetical order. So we'll start with the Akari, the Amblypygii, and the Arrhenii. 
The Ikari, uh, or the Ikari, are more commonly known as the mites and ticks. This group is incredibly diverse, with over 50,000 species, having had ample time to evolve and diversify after they emerged sometime in the Devonian period 419 to 349 million years ago. Collectively, they live in every habitat on the planet, and wherever they are, they have a valuable ecological role. Anatomically, their head region has almost merged with the abdomen, reducing the appearance of segmentation so that some of them just look like blobs or grapes, or very tiny grapes. In contrast, some species have elongated or worm-like bodies, but most of them have a thick, bulbous abdomen, and this, like I said, gives them a shape that's roughly similar to a grape with eight little legs. The Acari include two divisions, the Acariforms and the Parasitiforms. The Acariforms are a diverse group of mites with 32,000 described species, including the Epidermoptidae that live parasitically on the warm, wet flesh of mammals and birds, the Sarcoptes scabii mites that cause scabies, the Smarididae family, which are known for their characteristically bright red hair on their legs and their, their very pointed bodies, and the tiny Tydeidae family, whose member species have earthy colors and entrancing reticulated patterns on their dorsal plates. They mostly live in the soil, where they either hunt smaller bugs, scavenge detritus, or dig up and eat various fungi. The Amblypygii is another big arachnida division. These are also known as the whip spiders and the tailless whip scorpions. These nocturnal creatures have no silk glands, no venom, and they're generally nervous and shy. They don't have venom, so they don't really have a serious means of defending themselves against predators, so their best defense strategy is concealment. They prefer to hide in the biological debris on the floor of tropical and subtropical forests, like under the layers of bark and leaves and fallen logs. Curiously, their first pair of legs are actually not used for walking. These limbs have evolved to be very long, thin, and delicate, and they're now used as sensory organs, feeling vibrations in the air or water and sensing nearby chemicals. The six remaining legs are used to walk sideways, like a crab. Within the Amblypygii, there are five families. These are the Charontidae and the Paracharontidae, which are long-legged whip spiders, the Carinidae family of tailless whip scorpions, the Phrynichidae family, which includes beauties like the brown and yellow-spotted Daemon diadema from Central Africa, and the Phrynidae family of whip spiders and tailless whip scorpions found in the tropics and subtropics of the New World. The Phrynidae includes many species that live in subterranean tunnels and hollowed-out chambers, and others are known to defend territories against others of their kind. This makes me wonder about the, perhaps, overlapping territorial claims of individual Amblypygii. You might have Phrynidae that engage in subterranean battles in their tunnels to repel or dislodge a competitor seeking to expand or claim their territory. And now we come to perhaps the most well-known division of arachnids. This is the Arrhenii, or the spiders. Good old regular spiders. They're air-breathing, eight-legged, eight-eyed, silk-spinning, venom-injecting, web-crawling, centralized nervous system-having spiders that have adapted to almost every habitat on Earth, with the exception of the sky, the sea, and Antarctica. There's some 120 families within Arrhenii, comprising over 48,000 known species. This massive spider biodiversity is generally organized into two suborders the Mesotheli, with about 116 species, and the Opisthotheli, with close to 47,000 species. The Mesotheli suborder, the smaller of these two divisions, exists only in southeast and eastern Asia. These are primarily terrestrial spiders that live on and in the soil. They'll dig tunnels and burrows in the ground, and then line these tunnels with silk. Some species will even create little silk curtains or doors to compartmentalize their burrows. 
Some species, like those in the Lephistius genus, will go so far as to build trip wires out of silk to alert them of the presence of intruders. Among the Opistotheli suborder, there are a further two divisions, the Mygalomorphy and the Araniomorphy. The Mygalomorphy are larger, bulkier spiders that are typically covered in the spider version of hair, which is called sedi. These large, hairy, monster spiders are big enough and powerful enough to hunt larger prey than mere insects and other small arthropods. Some of them, depending on their size, can even hunt tiny vertebrates, like small snakes and lizards, rodents, and even small birds. Their large and very muscular chelicera are loaded with potent venoms, which can rapidly harm or immobilize their prey. This gives them the edge that allows them to take on larger prey animals, like clawed or fanged vertebrates. Some well-known Mygalomorphy species include the trapdoor spiders like the Idiosoma nigrum, or the Calithotarsus simoni, the funnel-web spiders like the Atrax robust, or the Porhotheli antipodiana, and all the various kinds of tarantulas, including the Megahexura fulva, the Microhexura montevaga, and the largest spider of all, the Therophosa blondi, also known as the Goliath bird eater. Outside of the Megalomorphy, you have the Araniomorphy, and these are known as the true spiders, and they're also the largest subdivision, containing the overwhelming majority of all spider species. These Araniomorphi spiders have chelicera that are angled towards a single point, allowing them to pinch their prey. This is a fundamental difference from the Mygalomorphy, which have parallel, vertically-oriented chelicera that can rub or grind food together to break it apart. Or, when they launch an attack at a prey item, the vertically-oriented chelicera allows them to bring maximum force vertically down onto their prey. You can't really do that, or you can't really bring as much force to bear with the diagonally-oriented chelicera that we see in the Araniomorphy spiders. Anyways. The vast biodiversity of the Araniomorphy can be split into five large families. The most basal of these five large families are the Hypochilidae, or the lampshade spiders, which live in the mountains of North America and Central Asia. Then we have the Gradungulidae, or the large clawed spiders, which are large, monstrous spiders with literal claws on the ends of their legs, and they live in New Zealand in the e eastern half of Australia and they are, uh, they're closely related to the Ostrochilidae family, which has two genera in the Andean forests of South America and another genus in Tasmania. And then there's the Haplogyne, which are unique among spiders in that they only have six eyes instead of eight. Some species within this group have four eyes, and some species among the Caponiidae have only two. Now, with respect to the, the Haplogyne, this haplogyne clade is a bit complicated. It's not necessarily monophyletic. It's, uh, some more recent evidence suggests that it's actually paraphyletic, and it's not itself a family. It's more like a paraphyletic superfamily. So what this means is that a lot of these animals, that a lot of these spiders that were grouped as the haplogyne, which is it's a distinction based on the physiology of the female genitals, a, a lot of the spiders in this group aren't actually super closely related to each other. It's not monophyletic. You actually have a bunch of these different, smaller families spread across the larger Araniomorphy clade that were traditionally grouped together under the Haplogyne, but I don't think they are anymore. Contrast this to the final grouping of the Araniomorphy. These are the Intelligyne. These Intelligyne are a monophyletic group. What makes them special is that the female genitals don't have one opening, it actually has three openings and two of them lead directly to sperm repositories or reserve chambers. It gives the female spider a little bit of control over whose sperm can fertilize the egg. So she, she has a little bit of control over the genetic qualities of her offspring. Okay, so where were we? Let's regroup. I was just talking about divisions within the Araniomorphy spiders, which itself is a division of the Opistotheli spiders which itself is a division of the Arrhenii order, which itself is just one of the dozen extant divisions of Arachnida, which is the big clade that we're looking at right now. 
So among the divisions within the Arachnida, you'll recall that I started alphabetically with the Acari and the Amblypygi, and of course, the Arrhenii. Well now, let's move on to the next few arachnid groups, including the Opilionese, the Palpigradi, and the Pseudoscorpions. The Opilionese, also known as the Harvesters, the Harvestman Spiders, or more commonly as the Daddy Longlegs, are a bountiful order with almost 7,000 described species. Some characteristic features of the Opilionese include their fused body plan. They have a single fused body mass, as opposed to pretty much all the other arachnids that have a, a body with two distinct segments, the, the prosoma and the opisthosoma. Also, they have no venom in their chelicera, they have no silk spinnerets, and they don't make webs. And they're actually able to eat solid chunks of food, so they, they don't have to grind their food into a powder and liquefy it before swallowing and digesting, like pretty much all of the true spiders have to do. The Opilionese also have a defensive pair of scent glands that secrete a strange-smelling, quinone-rich fluid that deters predators or other animals that might come too close and disturb it. As if that weren't strange enough, consider that almost all spiders are carnivorous predators. The harvestmen are omnivores who will hunt for animal prey, but they'll also scavenge for dead stuff. They'll dig through feces for edible particles, and they'll even eat plants and fungi, which is an extremely rare and uncharacteristic behavior for a spider or a spider relative. Among the Opilionese, there are five suborders. The Siphophthalmi mite harvestmen, which are smaller, stubbier, brown-colored spiders that live in caves or leaf litter on the forest floor. The Eupnoi, which are long-legged spiders that live in cooler, temperate, and Palearctic areas. The Dyspnoi harvestmen, which live in temperate regions of the southern hemisphere, with the lone exception of the Ortholasmatni subfamily that lives in Mexico. The Lineatoris harvestmen, which are very spiky, armor-plated spiders that live in leaf litter across the world's temperate and tropical forests. And the Terephthalmi, which is an extinct suborder whose fossils have given us remarkable insight into the evolution of spider eyes. Next, we have the Palpigradi, or the Microwhip Scorpions. These are very small, very pale, scorpion-like creatures, with long, segmented tails lined with bristles. The Palpigradi live in wet soils in tropical and subtropical regions, hiding under rocks and living in the mud so that they aren't dried out by the sunlight. They're tiny, soft, and fragile, and they have a relatively weak exoskeleton, which is why their fossils are disproportionately rare. We found them in Burmese amber deposits in Myanmar, which are about 99 to 100 million years old, but outside of these amber deposits, they don't really fossilize very well, and they're extremely hard to find. This is due in part to their, their shy demeanor and their tiny size. They don't fossilize very well. Due to this low fossil representation, in addition to their tiny size, their shy demeanor, and just the general objective difficulty in finding them by digging through the dirt, we really don't know too much about the Palpigradi. They're, they're still a, a biological mystery, an arachnid enigma. Next up in our alphabetical listing, we have the pseudoscorpions, also known as the false scorpions, or the book scorpions. They get their name from their large, segmented forearms with bulbous claws that look remarkably like those of a true scorpion, except the pseudoscorpions don't have tails. Instead, they just have little pear-shaped bodies. Speaking of their internal organs, the pseudoscorpions have lungs that are more similar to uh, insects than they are to other arachnids. Unlike the Palpigradi, we know quite a bit about the pseudoscorpions. For example, their fossil record extends back 380 million years to the Devonian period, making them one of the oldest land-based animal lineages and one that has changed very little across evolutionary time. They're found all over the planet, from the tropics to boreal forests, where they live under tree bark, in leaf litter, under rocks, in the sand, in the mud, in the soil, and more. They are hunters who prey upon various species of ants, lice, mites, moths, beetles, and flies. And despite having venom in their claws, they're harmless to humans, 
And they, they may even be beneficial to humans in the sense that their primary prey are widely considered to be obnoxious and potentially disease-carrying pests. All right, so now let's line up the last few divisions of the arachnids. We have the Rhysinulae, the true scorpions, the Solifugi, and lastly, the Thelophonida. The order Rhysinulae are also called the hooded tick spiders, despite the fact that they're, they're not actually spiders. The Rhysinulae species are small predators with a, a thick exoskeleton and a uniquely complex joint between their prosoma and opisthosoma body segments. The Rhysinulae prefer wet, damp, tropical habitats. And the reason they're called hooded tick spiders is because they have a special anatomical feature. They have a literal hood, or a hood-like structure, composed of exoskeletal tissues that's mounted over their face and head. The hood can be lowered to cover the mouth and the calicera as a form of protection. It really is a neat little feature. One of the more famous arachnid groups are the scorpions, of the order Scorpiones. These are incredible creatures, with eight legs, two large claws, and their most characteristic feature is the large, powerful tail that bears a fearsome stinger at the tip. They are ancient, having first emerged in the Silurian period some 435 million years ago and have adapted to virtually all habitats except Antarctica. Within the Scorpionese order, there's close to 1,500 known species, which represent a wild degree of biodiversity. For example, there's the Boothidae family of mid-sized, thick-tailed scorpions, which are often earth-tone colored, and they live in warmer, drier, terrestrial regions. There's the Carabactonidae family of hairy scorpions, who use their sensitive hairs to detect vibrations of prey animals in the soil. These include the burrowing Hadrurus spadix, which is native to the deserts of North America, and the similar Hadrurus arizonensis, which is bright yellow with dark coloration on its back, and it can grow to be almost six inches long. There's the Pseudocactidae family, which includes the Vietbocap genus of blind, pale scorpions that live in humid tropical caves in Southeast Asia. And despite the scorpions being numerous and having a scary reputation, very few of them are actually aggressive to humans, and even fewer of them are actually dangerous. Out of the close to 1,500 scorpion species, only 25 of them contain venom of sufficient strength and quantity to harm or even kill a human. In that sense, scorpions are much like the sharks. They look scarier than they actually are, and so long as we don't freak out over them, we'll realize that they're really wonderful animals that play a critical role in their local ecology. All right, so let's move on to the Solifugi, also known as the wind scorpions, the sun spiders, or the camel spiders, which are all rather strange names because they're neither a true spider nor a true scorpion. Remember what I said about scorpions being not as scary as they appear? Yeah, well, the camel spiders are legitimately scary. They don't move like spiders or scorpions do, so seeing one crawl around can be immensely unsettling. Their largest specimens can reach up to 5 or 6 inches in length, which is huge for an arachnid. And the most characteristic feature of the group are their freakishly large chelicera, which includes serrated claws that can be longer than one of their actual body segments. They're also terrifyingly strong. They're capable of breaking the bones of a small bird or lizard. They, they can crush it with just a pinch. It should go without saying, then, that their pinches and their bites are very painful, they can even break open human skin. Even more terrifying, they have complex eyes, which gives them remarkably good vision, which they use to effectively hunt and tackle prey, like termites, beetles, larger insects and other arthropods, as well as vertebrates like small snakes, lizards, birds, and rodents. Unlike the spiders, the Solifugi don't have spinnerets. They don't make silk, and they don't make webs. Unlike the scorpions, but similar to the pseudoscorpions, they don't have book lungs, and instead they use an insect-like tracheal network. 
they tend to enjoy warmer, drier desert biomes, like the brightly colored and very hairy Metasolpuga picta that lives in the Namibian deserts. But some species also live in grasslands and more temperate and tropical forests. This brings us to our last group, the Thelophonida, which includes both the regular and short-tailed whip scorpions. The name comes from their similar appearance to scorpions, except instead of a curved tail with a stinger, like a scorpion, they have a long, thin, whip-like tail. The short-tailed whip scorpions are sometimes grouped in their own clade called the schizomida. The schizomida are generally large but soft-bodied, with flexible armor plating. They don't have eyes, and they use their first pair of limbs, much like the amblypygi do, as sensory organs. They've evolved to be long and narrow, and they carry them in front of them to brush the ground and feel the air, and this compensates for their lack of eyes. The schizomida live in the soil of the tropics and subtropics where it's humid, and they can avoid desiccation. The thelophonida live in similar habitats. Curiously, they don't possess venom glands like many of the other arachnids, but instead, they have another kind of caustic chemical that they use for self-defense. When threatened, they'll activate glands near the rear of their abdomen, which spray a vinegar-smelling mixture of acetic and caprylic acid. This fluid can hurt any animal antagonists, getting in and irritating their eyes or their mucous membranes. It's not necessarily deadly, but it's certainly unpleasant. And it's pretty effective, too. It's, it's pretty effective at discouraging predators and making them think twice before they try and snack on the Thelophonida. All right, everyone, we have come to the end of the episode. This has been a very brief exploration of the taxonomy of the Chelicerates generally and the Arachnids specifically. If you thought these animals were wild and awesome, then hit that subscribe button because you're going to love the next three episodes, which will explore the rest of the arthropods, including the myriapods, the crustaceans, and the hexapods. If you're watching on YouTube, then give the show a like. If you're listening through the Apple Store, then give the show a five-star rating and leave a positive review. Subscribe if you're not subscribed already. And if you want to support the show in other ways, then check out our Patreon page and consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Check out the official store and buy some cool biology art that I made. And tell your friends and family about this awesome little biology podcast you found. Because anything you do to support the show, it all helps, and I really appreciate it. And as always, thanks for listening.